Patrick, thank you uh, for coming back on the show. We're excited to talk today. Sure, it's a pleasure, Ken. Great to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And and we were just catching up beforehand. Um, you know, for for the audience, I just finished your book, Atomic Focus, and one of the primary reasons that I wanted to have you on uh, again is you know a lot of the themes in the book uh, directly correlate to like goals that I've set for myself over this year, right? And th there's a couple of things that I'm really interested in. Um, one, you know, improving cognitive ability, focus being a huge piece of that. Um, sleep, <laughs> sleep might be my biggest focus this year. Um, you know, quality sleep, restorative sleep. Um, so just, you know, when I saw that this book came out, it really struck a chord with me um, for a number of reasons. So, uh, you know, maybe we could, maybe we could start there. Just, you know, why, why did this book need to be written? Um, the Oxygen Advantage was obviously really impactful. Um, and I know for a lot of people, it was eye-opening and life-changing in a lot of ways. Uh, what kind of inspired you to write The Atomic Focus? I suppose it's strong from my own experience. Atomic hmm. Focus is a very personal book. Um, like my journey was kind of strange because I was a kid that did not thrive in school, did not thrive academically. And at 14 years of age, I left school altogether, never to go back. And You're just, kidding me. I, didn't, I had no idea. It's the first time I wrote about it. It's in the back of Atomic Focus. Because oh. I suppose how many how, how many minutes do I have left in my audiobook? I didn't <laughs> unbelievable. Okay, I got to right at the back. Um, and then I, was, I suppose back in the day, it was kind of yeah, it was kind of accepted to some degree for mm. for you to leave school early because a lot of people might go into trades, etc. And a year later, I went back. Now the reason I left school was school wasn't for me at the time. Yeah, I was chronically exhausted. I was in that increased sympathetic drive. I was a mouth breeder, fast breeder, upper chest breeder, yeah. and I had a dreadful concentration and attention span. And um, for me to get grades, I went back. I was pretty driven. I set a goal to get into a pretty decent university. I did that, but university was a challenge. And I got through it, yeah. got my degree at the end. I didn't feel I enjoyed it. I felt it could have been mm. a lot easier. And the other aspect about it as well was that I remember getting into the university thinking that this is going to solve all my issues. And even when I graduated, I felt an emptiness there. I had mm. pushed myself so hard to spend four years to get that degree. I was constantly striving for the future. Yeah. And you sometimes know that things are not quite right, but you don't exactly know what's wrong. Sure. And life can, can direct you. And uh, I came across breathing by accident. I also came across presence of mind by accident, living mm. in the now, you know, 25 years ago, not very many people were talking about living in the now, you know, right. living in the now was something that was so weird and so strange. But I remember an experience that I went to a short two hour workshop in Dublin, a hotel in Dublin, and it was prevent presented by a number of two individuals. I walked out of that workshop. And I walked down this street, which I had walked many, many times before, but it was the first time I actually saw the street. It was the hmm. first time that I was fully present walking down that street. So whatever happened during the two hour workshop, and I have no idea, but when the presenters are in a state of presence, they can bring their audience in a state of presence. And they were in a state of presence. Hmm. And I woke up the next morning, my mind was chattering as ever, but I had a taste and it was very weird. And of course I knew nothing about it. And I, I went down that journey then. And I remember I was in Canada then in 2000, I picked a book off the shelf called The Power of Now. Now I was yeah. already into breathing. So it was right down my street, but it was bringing the two together. Now, so in essence, spirituality and breathing very much go hand in hand. And I suppose the breath should be considered the bridge between the mind and the body. Yeah. But in 2010, I wanted to bring together functional breathing with mindfulness. So hmm. bring together function and bring together spirituality and not calling it anything, you know, you know, too kind of woo woo or anything like that. 80 to 90%, I would even say more 90% of people who attended were, were females 
men were not turning up. And at that time, 2010, Ireland was in a pretty bad place economically. And men were under a lot of stress. And a lot of them, I knew stories that they were drinking a bottle of whiskey a day. You know, some of them, many were dying by suicide. (laughs) And they were dealing with, they were dealing with a racing mind and they were dealing with depression and they were dealing with all of these states the way a man might typically deal with it, because sometimes we're not the best at dealing with things. But yeah, shock, shocking, shocking to some listening, especially those <laughs> who are married to men. But oxygen advantage. I developed oxygen advantage as a means of bringing in a high performance breathing technique aimed at men, but not, mm. not talking about anxiety, not talking about racing minds, not talking about anything negative. But using it as a means of put this into practice and you'll get something out of it. This is performance driven. Now, mm-hmm. many of the tools are still used, but the language that we use to, to uh, convey what we want to convey to an audience is very, very important. Now, I can't imagine too many men going into a bookstore and coming out with a book calling on anxiety, but I can imagine them going in to a bookstore and coming out with a book on atomic focus. Because yeah. it's all about improving oneself. But the instruction mm-hmm. is the exact same. Because it's like this. When we are consumed by thought, and when we are drowning in thought, and when we are stuck in our heads, our stress levels are higher. We're more likely mm-hmm. to have anxiety, depression, our breathing patterns can change. And the very tools that we use to bring a stillness to the mind to improve focus and concentration and attention span, those same tools are used to address anxiety and stress and depression. Yeah. So that's what it was about. And they're the tools that I've used. And I really think that, you know, if you think we spent 16 years in formal education and we come out with an ability to break information into tiny pieces and to analyze and reason and decipher and regurgitate information. We've been taught and trained how to think. We do mm. not know how to stop thinking. And it's like this, mm-hmm. Ken. This is not just the tools for the workplace or for the sporting life or for military or anything like that. This is, these are the tools for everyday life. You could go into a Michelin star restaurant. Somebody hands you a beautiful dish of food. Mm. But if you're stuck in your head, you might taste the first spoon, the first forkful. You're, that's about it. Because in order to really appreciate what's been put in front of you, you have to be able to bring your, your focus from your sight onto the food and to really see the food. Yeah. You have to be able to smell it and to really smell it and to taste it and really taste it. But if your mm. attention is stuck in your head, you're not going to smell it, you're not going to taste it, and you're not going to see it. So yeah. there is something not just about the quality of the work that we can produce. And I know that some people can access these flow states and they can do it intermittently. They might do it during, say, for example, um, playing sport. But car- can mm. they carry that state of mind into their everyday life? And ultimately, this is what it's about. If somebody was to ask me, what is the one thing that I really feel is so powerful in terms of breathing? Mm -hmm. The one thing is for people to get out of their head and to connect with what's going on around us. Now, this is not mindfulness. This is going Mm. beyond this because how do you improve your focus? How do you improve your concentration? How do you improve your attention span? You need deep sleep. Yeah. This morning, I woke up feeling pretty lousy. And every now and again, that can happen. Yeah, I had a dog, two dogs that were barking all night because of storms and you have dogs Mm. barking and, and there's an example, waking up and a dog almost interrupting your sleep seven or eight or nine times throughout the night. I could not focus this morning. Now, this is a one-off event for me and I know it when it happens and every one of us is going to have a one-off event, but there's many Mm. people listening. And they wake up feeling lousy every single morning because of sleep disorder breathing, because of snoring, insomnia, obstructive sleep apnea, overstimulation of the mind. They're not getting that deep, deep sleep. So can those individuals access flow states? And just before, I know you're going to step in, but 
just before, mm. what are we talking about here when we talk about focus? Yeah. Focus is, you can look at focus in the broader scheme of things. I work in the field of breathing. My mm -hmm. focus for 20 years has been just one thing. And it can make me a very, a very boring individual because I know nothing about diet. I know very little about physical exercise, hardly anything at sure. all. And the only thing that I know about is breathing. And that's what yeah, I've focused very, on. Very, very deep, deep uh, set of expertise. <laughs> and that's in a broader sense. But, you know, on Monday when I wake up, I'm going to have my focus on what I'm going to do on that day in a narrower sense. So the, your focus is what are you going to put your attention to? Mm -hmm. And everything is clamoring for our attention, especially the mobile phone. Oh, yeah. And it's going to be a distraction. Now, your concentration then is your ability to hold your attention on that one thing. So focus mm -hmm. and concentration are two different things. Focus is what are you narrowing your attention to? Concentration mm -hmm. is holding your attention on that. And your attention span is the length of time that you can hold your attention on that. Focus yeah. multiplied by concentration multiplied by your attention span equals success. Mm, I like that. Well, and it's it's so interesting. Um, for whatever reason, whenever we're doing a podcast like this, I seem to be afflicted with whatever the guest uh, specializes in. So last mm. night, um, I've been sick all week. Uh, I've been exhausted, not sleeping well. And, and now, I mean, you know, I, I've been so focused on this over the last few years. I have a much greater sense of awareness when, my, when I'm below my baseline, sure. right? And I, I think I probably fell in that camp for years of starting off with a very low baseline because I was cutting back on sleep to, you know, quote unquote, try and be more productive or taking clients, whatever it was, sure, right? Sure. So my baseline was noticeably lower. And I think that's what spurred a lot of change. Um, but over the last few years, I've been really trying to take strides to just kind of, you know, raise that baseline every morning, kind of to use, you know, the same terminology you're using. Um, but last night I slept, you know, I, I felt as if I was asleep for a long amount of time, but when I woke up, I really kind of felt like groggy. Um, you know, I get this kind of sensation where my hands feel a little swollen or inflamed. And I was like, man, I slept a long time. My wife's like, you were snoring all night. She's like, I don't know what was going on because it's not typical, but she was like, you were, you know, really snoring. And I was just like, wow, that's so interesting. I'm here. I'm about to go talk to a breathing specialist, um, you know, and my wife gives me the feedback that I was snoring and snoring and I'm feeling a physical difference. So um, it, it's funny just how starting to try to become more aware of like how you're feeling is your sleep restorative. Um, you can start to notice those days when you really wake up feeling like, you know, you can light the world on fire and the day like today where it feels like you're kind of, you know, running in water. Yeah, uh, totally. And it's when you have that comparison to make, but many, mm. many people don't have this comparison because they wake up feeling pretty lousy all of the time. Sure. Now I was lucky, you know, I read this about, about this in a newspaper article back in 1997, 98, I taped up my mouth that night use nasal dilators and uh, not the first morning. I did it again the second night and I woke up the best night's sleep in about 15 years. I knew I yeah. was something just like when I came out of that hotel room, you know, oftentimes we kind of get a glimpse or a taste of something. We know mm -hmm. that something is not quite right. You know, yeah. and so, sometimes people ask like, how should you feel when you wake up in the morning? When you wake up in the morning, you should have the ability to get a complicated piece of text and read it and hold your attention on it. And most people mm. waking up, if you were to hand them a complicated piece of text, they wouldn't be looking at it because their attention is so stuck in their head and they wouldn't have the energy levels to be able to direct their attention to it. Now, yeah. the other aspect is we shouldn't be tired by 10 o'clock in the day. And <laughs> if we are tired by 10 o'clock in the day, as some people are, it's a sign that sleep quality is not as good as it should be. Yeah. How, um, so it's, you know, I can relate to that. For me, I haven't used a nasal dilator yet, but after reading Atomic Focus, I think I've now been pushed over the edge where, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to make a purchase. You might but, need you it. Know, I, you may well, not need it. I think it. I do. I think, well, let me, let me tell you what's going on over here and you tell me if I need it. So I, I've been punched in the face multiple times, either sports intentionally, unintentionally, whatever, it doesn't matter, but deviated septum, right? Mm -hmm. So I started using, um, the max breathe right strips. Um, 
and I kind of similar to what you're saying after using that for a few nights, I was like, wow, that alone created a significant difference because it just, it helped keep my airway open. And, uh, one of the biggest things I noticed was like, my mouth wasn't as dry, you know? So I was like, okay, so I probably did a better job breathing through my nose. Um, but what I'm finding is there's times where even that's not enough. Um, you know, last night being a perfect example. Um, so it's like, you know, again, kind of being on this journey of trying to improve sleep quality, you know, to hear just how impactful something like a nasal dilator was for you. I'm like, okay, that's, that's something that I don't think it was, I don't think it was the nasal dilator that was impactful. It was the mouth taped. That was the key. But Ah. I had to wear the nasal dilator because of chronic nasal obstruction. Now, Mm. coming back to what you're talking about, a deviated septum, it's very common. Yeah. But can you breathe functionally through your nose? Could you go for a walk with your mouth closed and breathe fairly comfortable as you're going for a walk? And if you can go for a walk with your mouth closed and breathe comfortably, you probably don't need nasal dilators during sleep. Oh, interesting. Okay. So what the nasal dilator does or the breathe right strip is simply just, it's based on the Kotlin maneuver. You put one finger either side of the nostrils, just gently prise your nostrils apart. You feel it easier to breathe. But Mm -hmm. the elephant in the room when it comes to sleep is nasal breathing. Now, 50% of your listeners here are going to be waking up at a dry mouth in the morning. And if you're waking up at a dry mouth in the morning, you're more likely to have disrupted sleep, lighter sleep and sleep disorder breathing. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it, it makes me kind of reflect back. I'm like, you know, was I ever breathing properly <laughs> for large portions of my life prior to this or kind but of, uh, you know, to the, what you were saying, was this just like my baseline was kind of so low. This is the thing, Ken. Um, how, yeah. how many kids are going through university and they don't have the ability to hold their attention on their curriculum. Mm-hmm. They don't have good retention. Their mind is so distracted. They're so stuck in their heads. And for them, they will get grades, but it's going to take a lot of work. And I'm nearly 50 years of age now. I've got a few more miles on the clock than you have. And if I knew back then what I know now, it would have been totally different. And I, again, coming back to atomic focus. Yeah. How on earth can we send a kid through high school and into university without giving them the ability to concentrate? Mm -hmm. Education does not teach us how to concentrate. There is nothing in education that actually teaches us how to hold our attention. It does not do it. But for us to get a good education, we need to have concentration and we need to have attention span. Now, Mm. the kid of today is much different than when I was in school 30 years ago because they have so many more distractions and big big platforms, etc., competing for that individual's attention. And the individual is naturally succumbing to it because of the pressures and the pressures on social media. Mm. It's really time that individuals take back their own minds. And it's time also that they take back their attention and not to be waking up of a Monday morning and saying, well, today I'm going to give two hours of my time today to Facebook or to Instagram or to YouTube or to the big platforms it's a bit of a waste because you're not getting much out of it in fairness. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and as someone who works in the technology field, I've I've always kind of been painfully aware of, you know, the, the user is the product and they just kind of don't realize it. Um, But, you know, one, one of the things that you said there, and I see it with my own kids is just the multitude of distractions that they are faced with on a daily basis that I didn't have as a kid. You know, growing up, and again, I'm, I'm 35, just turned 35, you know, you wanted to stop the distractions in our house. The TV got physically turned off, right? Yes. And then it was like, all right, go play, go outside, go ride your bike. Now, I mean, they're pulling devices out of the woodwork. And I'm like, where the hell did we put that thing? How did we even <laughs> have them get access to that? Uh, and they're little. And I'm like, man, we really got to be careful. It's just, you know, yeah. e- even a well-intentioned parent um, to, you know, quote unquote, protect them from exposure to all of these different things is, is no easy task. Um, no, it's not. And I would say the same. And my own child, yeah. you know, with iPhone, etc. But I suppose the one thing that we can do is get them into sports because mm. the sports, getting into sport, regardless of what the individual, the kid is doing, it's, it's almost that it's a microcosm of real life. 
you get into fights on the field, you get into arguments, mm. you've got wins, but you've also got losses. It's very important yep. to lose. It's very important to have disappointments. If it's mm-hmm. win, 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 win all, all the time, what is going to happen when we actually have a loss? We can't deal with it. But sure. if we understand that it's always about, you know, we have benefits, we have losses. And the other thing about it is that this too will pass. And I think for the last 25 years or so, being able to bring my own attention out of my mind and onto my breath, one thing, into Mm -hmm. my body is another thing, into the present moment is another thing. The highs are not so high, but the lows are not so low. And you get other benefits to it, intuition, creativity, and productivity. And I'm not going to say that it's absolutely perfect and that you're fully in the present moment all of the time. Of course you're not. But Mm -hmm. I have the capacity to bring my attention into the present moment whenever it demands itself during the day. I always so want to, you know, before I come on with you, I went for an hour's walk in in the countryside. Yeah. My intention going for that walk is to not to be walking with my attention stuck in my head, but to be actually to be there. And for me, it's something that's vitally important because even with a small business as we have, and we've grown quite a bit, it does bring its own challenges. And Mm -hmm. you've always got a certain amount of stress in business. That's the way it is. But being able to control it by changing your physiology and changing your states is really, really important. How many youngsters get into a difficult situation? How many sports people get into a difficult situation and they do not control their physiology because they don't realize that if you have some control over your breathing, you have control over your states of mind. And um, I put a quote into that book. I was listening to a podcast by Dr. Rangan Chatterjee. He's quite a well-known doctor in the United Mm -hmm. Kingdom. He was interviewing a brain surgeon. So you can imagine a brain surgeon, you have a patient out on the table in front of you, their skull is open and you're looking into the brain. Now that's a tricky situation. (laughs) And he says, he says, when I get into a tricky situation, the first thing I do is prevent myself from hyperventilating. Hmm. And he goes on, he says that people think that I'm born with nerves of steel. Now, of course, this doctor realizes it. He gets into a tricky situation. The body will automatically respond with faster, harder breathing. The brain interprets that when your breathing is faster and harder, that the body is under threat. And all the brain wants to do is to get you the hell out of the situation, get you away as, as far as possible. Right. The brain is here to protect the body. We all get into difficult situations throughout the day. How about whenever we get into a tricky situation, immediately bring our attention inwards onto the breath, take a soft breath in through the nose and a really relaxed and a slow and a gentle exhalation. Nobody Mm. will even know you're doing it. You can still be listening to the person. You can be looking at the person, but you have some attention inwards. You're taking a soft breath in through your nose and a really relaxed and slow and a gentle exhalation your body is telling the brain that everything is okay. The brain will send signals of calm to the body. And all it takes is between 90 minutes, sorry, 90 seconds to two minutes to help activate that relaxation response. But here's the thing, whenever we get into a situation, if we respond to it faster and harder breathing, we are not going to make a right decision because we are in this fight or flight mode. Now, some people naturally have it. Some people yeah. naturally can cope under pressure, but hmm. always so bear in mind, you might think that somebody is coping under pressure because they're not outwardly displaying anything, but are they running mm. in the inside? You know, are they mm-hmm. so consumed by it that they're bottling it up? And that's the other yeah. question to ask. We need to be able to change our physiology. The brain surgeon knows about it, but why doesn't the kid in school, why doesn't the sports player like, how many sports players get, they commit a foul, they mess up, they may be sent off. And so, sometimes at the most critical moment of the game, and as a fan, you're like, how could you not keep your composure <laughs> in this moment? But you're right, it's your physiology takes over. Yes, yes. Yeah. And it's, you know, in terms of, it's not just by by training breathing that we're, we're focusing specifically on the breath. And there's benefits to that. 
but mm -hmm. we're training the brain and that is very important and if you think of most goals are scored in the last five to ten minutes of a game mm -hmm. why does that happen why why isn't scoring equally distributed throughout the game it's because mm -hmm. one team gets tired fatigue yeah. sets in and we're talking about both physical fatigue but we're also talking about mental fatigue now, if we're consumed by thought, we don't have our attention on doing what we're doing, mistakes happen. We do the wrong thing. We fumble the ball. And when we can get into this flow state, the right action happens by itself. 60 or 90 minutes flies, and it seems like mm -hmm. it's, it's seconds or a minute. We're fully immersed in doing what we are doing. Our attention is not at the front of the brain the critical part of the brain, the thinking mind, because the thinking mind is too slow. You know, if a ball mm. is coming for you, you're not going to start consciously weighing it up. What am I going to do here? You want yeah, to you're, not doing trig you're not doing trigonometry to <laughs> sure. understand where that ball is going to land. Exactly. Yeah. So you want to get the critical mind out of the way. Mm. And having your attention in the center or even in the back of the head and your attention dispersed throughout the body, you go out and you play with every cell of your body. You're playing yeah. with every cell of the body and you get into that flow state. But it's, I'm going to come back to this because you remember there's a triangle in the book, Maslow's yeah. Hierarchy of Needs. Most people know about mm -hmm. it. Yeah, It's a motivational pyramid that was written back in the day. And he spoke about the importance of food, clothing and shelter. Most of us are fortunate enough. We have food, we have clothing, we have shelter. We don't have deep sleep. We have dysfunctional breathing patterns and we have lack of awareness and we are not going yeah. to reach self-actualization. The modern individual, we need deep sleep, we need functional breathing, then breath aware, body aware, mind aware, self-actualization. Yeah. Well, it, you know, you said a couple of things there. One, um, one thing that I can personally attest to um, and I, I think one of the things I enjoyed about your book was hearing some of those neurological and physiological processes that are taking place when you're doing breath work. And maybe we can even talk about that a little bit. But this idea of uh, transferability of that skill. You know, I maybe got introduced to meditation, boy, at this point, eight years ago. Um, and I'd, I'd done it off and on. Um, periods where I was really diligent, periods where life got crazy, and that was the first thing I cut out. And I've since, over the last year, been pretty diligent. But I, I remember having a real aha moment uh, sitting at my desk, and it was my first job, and I wasn't crazy about it. But after doing meditating, maybe it was a couple weeks, uh, maybe it was even just a week, I noticed my ability to focus on that one task singularly had improved. Um, and I just remember being like, wow, this is really kind of interesting because normally I'm like, oh, let me go get a coffee. Let me check my phone. Let me, let me talk to Bill. Let me and I just realized I was, I had a much better ability to stay locked in. Um, uh, and it, it, coincidentally, now that I'm thinking about what I was doing, think creatively, uh, in a way that had not come that easy for quite some time. So this idea of transferability, like, yes, um, you know, you make some fantastic points about, Hey, the breath work itself does some pretty incredible things, but the ability now to kind of apply that new skill in itself is, is really powerful, uh, whether in sport, in work, family. Um, that's one of the things that I, I think has been uh, so cool to actually see the benefit of. Yeah, and, you know, it's, and the other thing that I would say is that it's not just our state of mind when we're doing a meditation. I don't meditate. Mm -hmm. I haven't meditated okay. in 10 years. Um, I've done the long-term, the Vipassana meditations, back, whatever. But what, what I want to do is I want to kind of continuously bring my attention into the body or onto the breath or into the present moment many times throughout today. It's not so much the amount of time. And if I could, and, yes. and if I could interrupt, only, only because you just said something that I heard you say this in the book, but now it just really clicked. And I think the reason I jumped to meditation because in my life and, and probably frankly still, that was the dedicated amount of time that I would look to my breath and I would actually focus, right? Like I was focusing on my breath and I just had this aha moment where it's like for you and, and now I'll, I'll kick it back to you. It sounds like you're constantly or frequently checking in throughout the day. It's not 
sequestered to this small 10 minute window once so wow okay. yes yes i think it's i think it's more sustainable um mm. especially people now as well they don't have so much time like if you think the demands on people do an hour of physical exercise a day do sure. 20 minutes or 30 minutes of breath work get in your meditation nobody can do it i go for my walk i spent an hour just this was a walk i'm focusing on my breathing in and out but I'm also bringing my attention out into the environment to look, to, to listen, to feel, mm. to smell, taste, bringing my focus into the present moment. Now, I kind of do it a little bit unconsciously. It has been a great gift. And I would say to people that when you first do it, start with breathing. It's the easiest thing. And I would agree with you, Ken. It, there is a place for formal meditation, especially for somebody starting off. Now, hmm. I would even go further than just say mindfulness, just focusing on your breathing. Sure. Actually change your breathing patterns. You know, if you want to improve blood flow, if you want to improve oxygen delivery to the brain, breathe light. Hmm. If you want to stimulate the vagus nerve and get a better balance in the autonomic nervous system, slow down your breathing to between 4.5 and 6.5 breaths per minute. If you want to improve the biomechanics, focus on greater recruitment of the diaphragm. Do mm. this formally and then bring this breathing pattern because breathing is not just about one dimension. Oftentimes people do a breathing practice. Like I really feel that so many different modalities that have a lot of control over breathing, but they've made a mess of it. Because number one, they're teaching breathing to their students, but the instructor doesn't understand the dimensions of breathing. It's not just about mm. the biomechanics. We also have to include nasal breathing during rest, during low to moderate physical exercise, during sleep. It's vitally important. Mm -hmm. The mouth does nothing, but also to understand the biochemistry because so many people have cold hands and cold feet. And yeah. so many people believe that the more air they breathe, the more oxygen and delivery tr um, throughout the body. It is simply not true. And mm. how many people in an effort to help alleviate stress are taking these full big breaths and are ramping up? Full big breaths is an upregulator. It's a stressor. If you mm. want to downregulate, we have to consider the exhalation. It's the speed of the exhalation yeah. that determines whether we ramp up or we ramp down. If we're feeling overstimulated, mm. do we want, want to ramp up? Some people feel it's a reset. They get something out of it, but other people don't. For me, if I'm ramped up, I want to really focus on the exhalation. I want to take a soft breath in through the nose, a really relaxed and a slow and gentle breath out. And to even to breathe light, to underbreathe, because then carbon dioxide increases in the blood. I right. feel air hunger. That stimulates the vagus nerve. So there's a physiological process going on that when we breathe light, when we breathe slow, when we breathe low, when we breathe nose, all of these dimensions, all of these factors are going in to stimulate the vagus nerve. 80 to 90% of the nerve fibers of the vagus nerve are from the body up to the brain. When you stimulate the vagus nerve, it secretes a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine causes a slowing of the heart. The heart rate slows down and the brain interprets that everything is okay. Hmm. It's interesting because I, I was going to ask you, you know, what, what is happening in the brain when you move to like a more effective uh, breathing technique, but then by bringing up the vagus nerve too, it just kind of reinforce this idea of just like this, you know, what, what do they call it? The mind gut connection or, um, you know, it, it's just, uh, it's, it's a multitude of processes that are all working in unison. Um, you know, in some ways the heart follows the breath, uh, it sounds like, you know, and if I'm understanding what you just said correctly, in some ways the brain follows the heart, you know, it's all these like interoperating, interoperating signals. Yes. Um, that kind of lead to getting someone back to like a calm, um, you know, state out, outside of that fight and flight that unfortunately a lot of people live in uh, constantly, right? Yes, yes, yeah. And it's a recipe for inflammation. It's a recipe for disease. Um, mm. Like heart rate variability is a very interesting phenomenon. And a lot of attention on it in the last 
30 years or so, it's a measurement or an objective measurement of vagal tone. Now, oh. all of the devices that people are wearing is providing feedback of their HRV. And heart rate variability refers to the variance in the timing between heartbeats. Mm -hmm. A therapist of old, when they had a client coming in, the therapist would monitor the client's pulse rate. And while they were monitoring the speed of the client's pulse rate, they would also pay attention to the client's breathing. As the client was breathing in, the speed of the heartbeat should be getting faster. As the client is breathing out, the speed of the heartbeat should be getting slower. The mm. time between beats on the inhalation is shorter and the time between beats on the exhalation is longer. This implies good balance in the autonomic nervous system because our heartbeat shouldn't beat at the same beat all the time. There should be mm. variance. Yeah. But if an individual is overly stimulated, the variance in beat to beat reduces. And this is not a good sign. People who are physically and emotionally unwell tend to have reduced heart rate variability. Now, everybody seems to be wearing aura rings and whoop bands and all of this stuff, Leaf, Leaf HRV. Um, yeah. Jay Wiles, Dr. Jay Wiles has brought one out called Hanu Health, which I think is a really good one. Hmm. And all of these devices, they give you feedback of how you are doing. What's your resilience? Because this is a measurement of resilience. Yeah, how, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. How do you optimize it? That's the key. And that's where breathing mm. can play a role. It's not just about breathing. Cold water exposure, humming, gargling, physical exercise, but breathing definitely has a huge role to play in terms of optimizing HRV. So, you know, for, for people listening to this, right, you know, if I put myself in, in their shoes, they're probably like, well, this, this all sounds great. You know, where do I even begin? Um, right. Like, it, you know, do I need to, do I need to pick up the oxygen advantage and, and start doing some of these really, um, you know, focused breathing exercises, or is this something that I could start doing today right now? Oh, totally. Start breathing through your nose. Make sure that yeah. you wake up in the morning with your, with your mouth moist, go for your walk or jog, with your mouth closed. Why, mm -hmm. why do we have to do low to moderate physical exercise with the mouth open? What does the mouth do? You know, when we're breathing through the mouth, what does the mouth do physiologically to the breath? It does nothing. The mouth mm. is a hole. It's a hole whereby air can go straight down the throat. But mouth breathing tends to activate the upper chest. It's a faster breathing pattern, etc. Go to YouTube. Even though I'm giving out about social media, we put a video on Atomic Focus. There's one on breathing there, which I included the exercises. So the, the video companion to the book it's a one hour video mm -hmm. and I, I bring it. It was a workshop that I did by Zoom, but we recorded it. People knew we were recording it for the purpose of putting it up on YouTube. Start practicing. And I think, I think Ken, it's the understanding. I would have loved to have an understanding of my breathing when I was in university. Mm. I would have loved it when I was in the corporate world, but I didn't. And I couldn't cope so well. And that's what Atomic Focus is about, you know? It's, it's about kind of just bringing some awareness to what we can do to help improve our states and we can achieve things easier. You know, if this is our goal, if our goal is to be more productive, if our goal yeah. is to be more resilient, why not tap into the resources that you already have? You know, so yeah, it's, it's understand it. And also have some, don't have your attention stuck in your head all the time. I think people will yeah. understand this. How many times have we walked down a street? We haven't been there at all. We are consumed by thought. And it's the same example that I made at the start. If you go to a Michelin star restaurant, somebody puts a lovely dish of food in front of you. Are you actually there? Or are you mm. living in thought? If you're in living in thought, you might as well have a bowl of cornflakes in front of you because you're not going to right. appreciate the meal anyway. Yeah. Well, it, you know, and kind of to, to bring it back to what you said at the beginning, right? I don't think uh, as many men would be willing to walk out of a bookshop holding a book on anxiety. Um, but this idea of having some control over changing the way you feel your attention, the way your body responds to thing things. I think like for someone like myself, 
Uh, really, really interesting. And there was something that you said in the book too, or, or it might have been someone that you were interviewing. This idea of being able to conquer yourself first, um, be able to conquer like the physiological responses that happen to yourself as as opposed to just purely kind of being uh, held hostage by them. I can't remember if it was the tennis player or the model. Uh, but I was like, wow, like, you know, that's that's such an interesting way to look at it. Because, um, again, back to your example about school, we're taught to go through school. Uh, we're taught that to be effective in school, you need to have great attention to be able to control your focus and do all these things. But we're not teaching people the underlying skills uh, to have that good foundation so that they can actually get through the curriculum. Um, and yes. just to extend that to everyday life, like I'm thinking about myself at work. I just had a very stressful day yesterday and I, I hadn't slept well, you know probably not able to um, control it, so to speak, uh, to a way or to the extent that I would like. But again, just now having some awareness, like, hey, there's some things I can do to kind of get myself to, to calm back down or maybe not be at such like a high throttled emotional state. I can kind of like try and control my emotions a little bit, make clear decisions. Um, that's something that when I, you know, when, when listening to this book, I was like, this is, this is like really, um, exciting, I guess, right? A cause for optimism. Because I think most people relate to a lot of these experiences and the thought that there's something that can be done uh, to kind of grow that skill set over time, I think is, you know, hopefully, like I said, encouraging for folks. I think intuitively, we all get this. You know, if somebody walks into your room, and they're in a foul humor, they're hmm. polluting their own mind. But they're not just polluting their own mind. They're polluting the mind of everybody that they're going to come into contact with. Now, yeah. how many people that when consumed by thought, that they are affecting everybody around them and the environment around them. Mm -hmm. And there's just something nice about being just something soft. And by the way, people might think, well, Jesus, this is going to make me a walkover. I absolutely tell you not. I'll give you an example. Yeah. I work I work with some elite military snipers and the reason that I'm brought in is because I teach them when to pull the trigger of the gun, the sniper. Now these guys are highly trained. They're all pretty mm. much in their thir 30s. They're young, they're very physically fit and they're the elite of the elite internationally. My whole role was to come in and think of the breadth and physiology and altering physiology when to pull the trigger. Do you mm. breathe in and pull the trigger? Do you breathe in and start exhaling and towards the bottom of the exhalation, you pull the trigger? Do you breathe in and hold your breath and pull the trigger? Do you breathe out and hold your breath and pull the trigger? And I was sitting down and I said, okay, let's bring simple physiology into this. During the inspiration, mm. during the inhalation, the vagus nerve steps back the foot has taken off the pedal. So there's an acceleration. It's the exhalation that the foot has put to the pedal and everything slows down. And if you really slow down hmm. the exhalation, you slow down the timing between heartbeat and the time to pull the trigger is when the time between heartbeat to heartbeat is at a maximum. So you're taking a very soft breath in and a really slow and relaxed exhalation. And towards the bottom of the exhalation, when it's slow and relaxed, the difference in time between heartbeat to heartbeat is its widest. You pull the hmm. trigger in the middle. Simple stuff, but it works. And after yeah. that, I then found a video on YouTube with by a US Marine. And he also was talking about when to, when to pull the trigger. He's a sniper. He didn't mention anything about breathing but he spoke about the heartbeat, but it's hmm. through our breathing that we can influence our heartbeat. Now, yeah. breathing is good enough for these guys. Why isn't it good enough for everybody else? And right. think about their job. You know, now sometimes yeah. people, when I spoke about this in podcast, they said, I'm not very spiritual teaching snipers how to pull a trigger of a gun. Well, listen, these guys can be brought into a hostage situation. You could have innocent mm. people and it's been in different countries. You have innocent people, say, for example, in a cafe and uh, there's a, a terrorist or something inside. Sure. We need snipers to be there, but we need those snipers to be absolutely clued in. Now, that is focus. 
And these guys have mm. shifts. They Their shift is one hour at a time. So how many of us can actively direct our attention for one hour and not to hmm. deviate outside of that? Many people, yeah. their attention span is a few brief seconds. And this is what differentiates a leader and a real leader. Because a real leader is the person who can who can devise the plan, who can follow through, who can come up with strategy when things are going wrong. You know, mm -hmm. any monkey can run a business when things are going right. The measure of the leader is how well you perform when things are going wrong. Who is going to step yeah. up? You see it on the sports field. You know, think of the best teams and think of one or two individuals that when they are losing, you've got one or two individuals, the, the leaders, and they're able to rally the troops. That's what it's about. Mm. These guys are yeah. able to maintain their focus, their attention, their concentration, regardless of what's happening. They have control over their physiology, but I would say they have it naturally. Mm. I didn't have it naturally. I had to train it. We can all train it. Yeah. Well, you know, in that, that sniper example, I can't think of a more um, high stakes, heightened emotional state, uh, you know, uh, situation to operate within. So that's that's a great point, right? If it's good enough for them, it, it can probably help you at your day job as well. Um, well, Patrick, this has been uh, honestly one of my favorite conversations and something I'm so interested in. So so thank you for coming on. I know the listeners have probably taken a lot away from this. Um, we've talked a bit about your book. You know, wh where else can I point them uh, if they'd like to learn more? I can certainly link to the YouTube. Um, I can link to Oxygen Advantage. Any any other resources that maybe you would suggest? Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. We, we have Instagram yeah. as well, um, YouTube, and the website then, oxygenadvantage.com. And um, that, that video, people will find, if they found this conversation interesting, the practical application of the exercise, they'll find it on YouTube. I can't remember what's, what's the name of the video, but it's on our Oxygen we'll Advantage. Track, we'll track it down. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Well, Patrick, thank you. And uh, yeah, next next book, you got to come yes, back. Yes. The next book is currently, we're writing it. I'm writing it at the moment. And oh, um, I'm expecting it probably in about 12 months time. It's about bringing Perfect. breathing into yoga. Oh, very cool. Because I feel there's awesome. there's a modality here that has the, the potential to influence millions of people even beyond what's already happening. And if the yoga instructor knew the depth and the potential in breathing, any student coming in their door, if the student is coming in with high stress, with asthma, with depression, with sleep disorders, looking to improve their sports performance, mm -hmm. they could use breathing techniques that go way beyond what's already being taught. So that's yeah. what it's about. Ah, oh, amazing. Well, Patrick, thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to having you back in the future. Great stuff. Thanks, Ken.